go. So, well, Georgie, officially, welcome to the My Mate podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, absolutely. And I think, like, like we said before, you know, the best thing about the internet is just like, bang, bang, like-minded individuals, let's do a show together. Yeah, exactly. I just knew we'd have lots to talk about. Absolutely. So tell us about, because you're about to launch your podcast. So tell us a bit about it. Yes. Oh, well, it's, it's still top secret. Okay. Um, <laughs> the Move public on. can't know. But it is called the Anxiety Reset Podcast. So basically um, going through all of those aspects of what I call the Anxiety Reset Method. This is what I learned. It's kind of like my life experience plus my education. I've, I've studied, for, studied my naturopathy and nutrition degree for four years, learning all about the gut, learning all about how nutrition plays into this. Um, and the, but, I, but I always found that there was a part of the, the puzzle that was missing. So for me, I tried psychologists. It didn't resonate with me. That wasn't the right thing for me personally. Although I think that, you know, it, it can be fantastic for other people. And I think it's really about finding the right person. Yep. Um, but through that journey, you know, I tried to, I, I tried to get the, the nutrition perfect. And I was like, if I just get, if I just eat all the right foods, then my brain will function differently and I will take the anxiety away. But that ended up, I, I went overboard and that ended up causing more anxiety. So <laughs> it, it was, not, you can't, you can't just look at, I, I mean, I believe you can't just look at that one piece of the puzzle and say, you'll fix your anxiety. You can't just heal your gut and expect that to fix your anxiety, even though the two are linked. What I believe more is that we can increase our resilience to anxiety by looking after our gut health. That's one component, um, but there are many components. And, and so this is what the anxiety reset method's all about is looking at all those different facets and putting them together in a combined approach, uh, which has been working really well for my clients and my program members. And that's what the podcast is all about. Just exploring that further. How can we look, how can we talk to different um, thought leaders in the area as well uh, and open up those topics? Mm, that's so good. And it's so important as well, because for whatever reason, and well, you know, there is an evolutionary reason, but anxiety just gives you that real sense of isolation. So creating a podcast around anxiety is, is so uh, welcoming, I think, to a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. Because that's one of the things that I like to do with the podcast too, is trying to choose people who have experienced anxiety. So they they can offer something of value in terms of practical information or um, tools that other people can use if they're listening. But also um, I always ask people to share their story with anxiety. Yep. And it's not that hard to find people with a story about anxiety, I have to say. <laughs> I know, especially at this time. <laughs> oh my gosh, coronavirus. <laughs> Were we gonna? Were we ever gonna get away with not mentioning it? Yeah, I'm, yeah, exactly. Good point. Good point. I'm I couldn't trying help but so notice. hard. <laughs> I'm trying so hard not to keep talking about it and to like not keep giving energy to it, but it's just everywhere, isn't it? I know. I, yep. Yep. Absolutely. And it, it does depend, I suppose, on how you look at it. You know, because when any anomaly arises, you know, there's always a positive and negative. The negative is okay. People are suffering. Coronavirus is a thing. The positive is okay. In the future, we're now more aware of hygiene. It's crazy mm. to think that people don't wash their hands. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm washing my hands like 10 or more yeah. times a day at the moment. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like I've got a problem. Like I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. obsessing about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure most of the world are. Yeah. Oh, just, for sure. Yeah. Like that is, that is something that I'm finding very fascinating about this situation. I'm choosing not to see it as a scary situation. I'm choosing to see it through the lenses of this is interesting. This mm. is fascinating. How can we bring it down to a more of a neutrality? Do the practical things, you know, wash your hands, um, socially uh, distance yourself, all of those practical things, be aware and informed. But I don't know that we have to get caught up in the hysteria um, as, as much. And it kind of reminds me, I don't know if you've heard of this um, Chinese proverb before about the, the farmer. Oh, yes. I won't go into the whole story. Do you know this story? Uh, so, good luck, bad luck. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So please, please quickly, tell it, please tell it. It's so good, it's so explain. good. There's a farmer in a village and he, his horse goes missing and the village people say, oh, what terrible luck you have. Your, uh, your horse has gone missing. And he says, maybe we'll see. 
And then the next day the horse comes back and he's actually found a whole lot of other wild, um, wild ponies and brought them back with him. And then the village people say, Oh, what amazing luck you have. The, <laughs> the horse has come back. Now you have, now you have five horses. And the farmer says, well, maybe we'll see. And it goes on and on and on and something good happens, something bad happens. And it just really highlights how we label things good and bad. And I think Tom looking at the, if we zoom out from this whole coronavirus situation, um, you know, I don't, I, in no way do I want to dismiss people's feelings or the, the potential for fear here. Of course, I understand why people are afraid, um, but there's a lot of hypothesizing going along or going around, a lot of predicting the apocalypse. Yeah. And I think there are absolutely positives coming out of this whole situation too. I mean, one would be the massive reduction in CO2 emissions and pollution over China. You can see the reduction from space, I've heard. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. So long term, potentially this could be a real yeah wake up call for the world. Yeah, you're so right. And it's so important for us to remind ourselves of that fundamental truth because it's so panic is like this thing that just takes us all by storm and it's needed to because if we're all looking at a wild bear it's like well okay we all need to be safe but it it's so important to remind ourselves that you know hey we're not in the wild anymore we have a very large front part of the brain here we can rationalize we can think and then it comes down to i suppose responsibility to choose not to get swept up in that and um listen to people like me and you <laughs> yes exactly we're so wise exactly um, exactly yes <laughs> well um you know as you say with the panic there's this real sense of kind of separation that like everyone's in it for themselves like especially with the supermarket shopping that's been going on um and i just think you know, honestly, I'm just trying to encourage people to remember other people, consider others and be kind. And I think that in a situation like this, communities do come together, mm. obviously at a safe distance. Yeah, <laughs> very true. But with lots of hand washing. Yes. But, um, you know, that's a beautiful part about all these things too. We all have this one thing that we, every single person on this planet has in common at the moment. We're all dealing with this same problem, which is, um, something that can really bring us together. Mm. And to be honest, I'm kind of thinking if I were to wrap, I've got, I, I mean, I, I happen to have um, good food supplies anyway. My mum has been hoarding and like preparing for this oh, for good, the last good. years. Yeah. So that's just her norm to always have lots of food. Awesome. Um, if we ran out of food, surely, and if, if like our neighbours ran out of food, we would share that with, the, with them, mm. you know, and I just trust that communities we can share together so like why do we have to rush to the supermarket and quickly grab everything because what if everyone else takes it and then there's none left for me mm. you know it's a real it's a real tri like primal um instinct isn't it absolutely and i actually was wondering if you could um talk about that more um as an anxiety coach but also as someone that has experienced it um there is that i suppose not at the start of one's recovery and rehabilitation but as you move towards the end of it you start to recognize that and for good reason anxiety is that real what if me 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 mm -hmm. how how do you describe that you know that it's like we want to try to move ourselves away from a me first approach oh totally so i think the best thing is like so so there is very much a self-preservation instinct there it's i need to survive and I'm number one. And your brain is going to drive that because it, your brain wants you to stay alive. And that's a very normal, natural instinct. But I think it really com comes to kind of watching yourself and going, whoa, wait a second. I'm getting caught up. This is what happens when we get caught up in our, what I call out, like our mind chatter, the ego just on its, on its spiral going around. And we, we do this, you know, coronavirus or not we do this yeah. about all sorts of things you know oh god that that email from work um you know we, we we react to it and we think about how how this impacts us and and our own survival instincts kick in um but the best thing we can do is i i sort of encourage people to do what i call tuning in and finding that voice from your true self so mm. if, you, if this is about separating away from what the mind is saying 
Um, it takes a bit of conscious effort to do that. Um, but watching this, oh, there's this fear story happening right, right now. I'm, I'm in that scarcity mode. I'm, I'm feeling like there's not enough for me in the supermarket. Yeah. Um, and watch <laughs> observing that and noticing, oh, that's just my brain trying to protect me right now. Um, the best way to, to experience this, I think, is with the, the practice of meditation or even like a mini meditation. This is what I encourage people to do. If it's like a two minute, just tune in, notice what you're feeling in your body. Where's that coming from? Notice those thoughts. It's the true version of you. The true voice within you is the part of you that is observing your thoughts. Mm. And when we can connect to that, we can step away from that thinking and start to think, okay, actually, how can I help others? And when we are feeling helpless, trying to be helpful is honestly the best remedy, mm. you know? Yeah, I love that. It reminds me of um, one of the famous quotes by Mahatma Gandhi. And he says, you, uh, you find yourself by giving yourself to the service of others. And it's so difficult to, to do when you're in that because every sense in your body and your, in your brain is being like, if you do that, you're screwed. You're actually going to die. So taking that true leap of faith um, will we'll, we'll get us there, I suppose. I to couldn't agree more. And practicing trusting those leaps of faith, as small as they might be, or bigger ones as well, has been my life's work in dealing yeah. with my own anxiety, really. Like I remember in particular, there was a, I was in a long-term relationship um, a few years ago and I just we'd been together for six years and I really just felt um, a feel, like a sense that I needed to, to move on. And yet it was so comfortable in that relationship. Yeah. And I really loved him. Um, but it was just, I needed to make this leap of faith and something in me was screaming at me. Yes. Like do this. There's, there's more adventures for you. You've, you've, there's more opportunities for you. And I had no evidence of that, but I trusted it. And I took that leap of faith. And that was a momentous part of my own kind of healing with anxiety because mm. it was, it was the universe caught me, you know, yeah. the world was there. The, the adventures did happen and I doubted it and I worried and I was like, what if it doesn't happen? What if I, you know, have done this and it was all a mistake. I just think when you do learn to kind of take those leaps of faith, trust that things are going to be okay. It's never led me wrong. And yeah. it only, my trust only deepens and deepens and deepens as life throws more curveballs at me and you just have to keep kind of going, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, I think this is a great um, segue to rewind it. And um, if you could give people a brief description of, um, of your story, it doesn't have to be brief, actually. I've got nothing but time. So <laughs> we're, we're all quarantined anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> we could go on for hours. We could, we could. People. Yeah. Um, and keep reminding them again and again, let's think of others because it's, I was going to say before, when you said, um, it's really hard when you're in that headspace you, you, on some level, sometimes you just need a, an external person reminding mm. you to, okay, let's think of others though. But my story, mm. um, where shall I begin? I, I usually begin with the fact that I was really lucky with my childhood. I didn't have, um, a turbulent childhood. Um, and, and that was the, the glory days of my life. But what that set me up for was a real wake up call and a shock when I was 19 and my parents divorced. Wow. Uh, and that was a big rift in the family. And so I think with these, what we, you know, it's interesting what we label as trauma and how we compare those traumas to other people. I've always thought, oh, but my trauma isn't as bad as someone else. Um, but it, it is all relative. And, and I think, yeah, to someone who was like, oh, Life's all great. Everything's fine. Within the reason. Yes. You know, yeah. I suddenly had the, like the, the whole world crumble and it, it was, um, I wasn't prepared for it. I didn't have the resilience and I didn't know how to deal with it for a long time. And so that really shook me up for a number of years. And um, it was for me, anxiety was like waking up every morning, heart racing, feeling like, my life's taken a turn that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't like where my life is now. I don't like life with my family broken. I don't like this new, new situation and, and, you know, not being able to see dad all the time because he, you know, lives somewhere else and I was still living at home at the time. And, you know, just those kind of, those kind of things, like suddenly 
uh, my dad wasn't available to me. He had, mm. he, he moved on to a new relationship um, and has had since had other children, which is, you know, something I've come to accept now. But at the time, um, yeah, a solid figure in your life of support. Um, I've had to kind of, I suppose, adjust. Like the biggest step moving forward for me was forgiveness. Yep. That took about four years yeah. to get there. I actually found that book. Um, are you familiar with Louise Hay? No, no. Oh. Oh, that's she's not... a legend. Wow, okay. She's, she's like the mother of all of the affirmation work. Oh, in, nice one. In sort of, yeah. Um, and she, I just found her book. It was colourful and nice. And it said, you can heal your life. And at the time, I felt like I needed that. So yeah. I, I found this book. And that was my first sort of introduction, I suppose, into the whole um, self-help journey and, and, in, and exploring your inner world. And one of her chapters said, and I now teach this to people too. It, it said, uh, it was talking about the importance of forgiveness. And then it said, who would be the hardest person to forgive? They're the person you have to forgive the most. Oh God. So good. Yeah. So hard though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just sitting, sitting on this beach, like crying, like, yeah. kind of trying, like <laughs> you yeah. know? throw the book um, in the water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Had my journal there, was writing it out and I was forgiving everyone I could think of. And um, yeah, the hardest people to forgive were actually second hardest was my dad, but mm. the, the the real hardest one was um, the his his new wife. Oh yes, because um, yes. she's the other. I didn't have you know I I still love my dad. <laughs> oh yeah, but I could demonize her if I wanted to. Yes, and it makes so much sense. Like at that age, that's so interesting how similar our stories are. You know, like my parents really? divorced when I was eighteen, and that was my oh. trauma. You know, because you learn about trauma and you're like, well, I didn't go to war. I wasn't sexually abused. But the, the, the blunt force um, volatility carpet pulled from beneath your feet compared to what your life was, you know, um, is so hard to re-navigate that you, it's exactly right. Exactly what you said. Pain is relative. And how do we pick up the pieces from here? I can't imagine what that would be like because at that age, I just imagine you would see the result of that anxiety and everything that's come undone in your, um, in your family because of that other so easy to demonize. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, and it's an ongoing thing. Like sometimes even now a little thing will come up and I'll feel that egoic urge in me to blame and throw, you know, like judgment at her. Mm. Um, but I just have to, you know, I just remind myself, this is just a human being just trying to be happy in this crazy, crazy world. Mm. And, you know, I think that always helps going back to the, the level of seeing someone as a human who has flaws, who's just trying to make the best choices they can for their life and just trying to be happy. Mm. That's such a, and it's so important, I think as well, you know, um, Ram Dust is someone that I loved and he passed away um, not too long ago. And his analogy was that, you know, for whatever reason, we look at humans differently uh, to the way we look at trees. But when we go out into a forest and we look at trees, we don't judge them for being bent or, you know, discolored. We just recognize that that tree perhaps didn't get enough sun when it was young. That's right. And so in, you know, going back to the example of my, my dad's um, second wife, the, you know, who am I to judge what she has gone through with her life, her parents, her life experiences that led her into um, those, those, that situation. Um, and it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. Yes. Ego doesn't like it, yeah. but, but a much more peaceful way of living your life at the end of the day. When you hold a grudge, you're the one that suffers. They're not suffering. It's, yeah, absolutely. And, and so you're only setting yourself free. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Despite how good it feels, I love yeah. hurting myself. <laughs> I know. So where did the um where did the naturopathy stuff come into this? Okay, so I floated around for a bit, um, trying to work out what I wanted to do with my life, and and you know had the anxiety, and I was afraid of every turn and I'm um, not sure what to do, but it, for my career, I suppose, um, I, I always thought I was going to end up studying law because that's what the family, a few people in my family did and um, friends and things. But I have always been a bit, 
I don't know, it just didn't resonate with me. I saw um, their, that kind of life and I didn't want that. And that's all I knew. So that was my intuition talking to me pretty yeah. early on. And I just remember looking at the, like, what I would be learning in my naturopathy and nutrition degree and all the subjects just like made me so excited. So mm-hmm. I followed that excitement. And um, through that time, that's where I learned a lot about nutrition, um, thought I could save myself with just food and not actually doing the meditation, not actually looking at the forgiveness stuff, you know, um, all of those other components that I think are so important as well. And I got too obsessive with it. And I ended up being really restrictive with food, like not restrictive as in I wasn't eating, but I was restrictive with, I can't eat that. No, no, I don't eat that. Can't go out to that cafe because they don't have anything that I can eat. Um, You know, just starting to get way too overboard with it. I didn't drink alcohol at all. And that was a, that was a solid rule for me in my early twenties when that's what all my friends were doing. So it was a bit socially isolating, but it was something in my head that, that I don't know, it, it seemed like I was like, well, I don't mind not drinking alcohol and that's a healthier way to be. So I'll just do that. Whereas now I really encourage people not to drink all the time, not to be yeah, drink, but <laughs> Yeah. But like, you know, if you've got a really fun, like it's your best mate's wedding, like, and you want to have a few drinks, enjoy that. Know that the payoff is probably going to be the next day. You're going to be hungover. You're going to be probably heightened anxiety if that's mm. you. But, um, but don't cut yourself off from the potential uh, like fun of that social event and the connection that, that does come from some alcohol. And, and at the end of the day, it's always going to be about flexibility and freedom that's going to really set you free. It's not going to be hard and fast rules. So when it comes to food these days, I really encourage people to, you know, learn, learn the facts, learn about, okay, so dark leafy greens have a lot of magnesium and B vitamins and with anxiety, we tend to use up a lot of those nutrients. So it's good to replenish my body with those a lot, um, ideally every day, but not stressing if you haven't done that today or, you know, making it an obsession. It's just like, you know, actually I really enjoy, like personally, I really enjoy adding spinach to a smoothie in the morning for breakfast. Yeah. Like I don't taste it. I can't taste it. It doesn't. And, and so everything I have in it, it tastes delicious. So it doesn't feel like um, I'm deprived in any way. And I think that's really important. Anyway, so yes. that's kind of how I got out of that obsessive food time. Um, I think a few friends also kind of were concerned about me right. um, and brought that to my attention. And I didn't like it at the time. I thought they were like judging me and attacking me, but no, they, yeah. were, they were coming from a good place and I'm grateful for those friends now. Um, but yeah, I... I during that, so so that's like I guess I was just following that excitement into into naturopathy and nutrition, and um, ended up kind of uh, graduating from from my four year degree, and realized I practiced for two years as a as a general naturopath treating everything, but I always because anxiety was something that I'd experienced so intensely. And everyone else I studied with had their own condition. Like someone, you know, someone got into naturopathy because they had a a thyroid condition or a hormone imbalance. But for me, I didn't have any of that. And I always thought I didn't have a story. Like I thought I didn't have a health condition. Then I was like, wait a second, anxiety. Yes. That's that's my thing. So I had had experience in those two years of this very busy clinic in Melbourne um, where I I had, you know, saw lots and lots of patients. um, And pretty much all of them had anxiety, but I was seeing everything as well. So people would come to me with a a weird skin rash or a um, thyroid condition, autoimmune or um, fertility issues. And for each of these things, you're expected to be the expert on all of those different conditions, but they are all so complex. Mm. And what I realized was I didn't always feel like I was the, the one with all the knowledge on the skin issue or all the knowledge on the fertility issue. So I didn't always feel as comfortable that I was the best person for that. But what I love now about what I do is I know so much about anxiety. I've had so much experience working with people in that specific thing. Mm. Um, but I have like, I love that. I don't get that icky feeling in my stomach anymore. When someone comes to me wanting my help, I know I'm the best person for them to see. 
that that's such a brilliant that's a a, it's so lovely to hear and actually it's so good to hear about how the journey because it sounds to me like um that journey um you know culminating in uh finding a, a lane to give back was also the thing that also helped you with your own recovery yeah totally and i think finding a sense of purpose is a wonderful part of recovering from anxiety too and I, I'm fortunate that I've found mine um, in helping people with anxiety. Mm. Um, mm. But I believe everyone has a story and value to share. Um, you were just saying before, Tom, I think before um, we started this, that, that everyone should have a podcast because yeah. we, all, we all have something to offer. And, and I don't think everyone needs, who's had anxiety needs to be doing what I'm doing. But we all have our hidden gems and ways that we can offer value and you know, for the people who have been through perhaps greater traumas than you and I, um, I often say, say to them, this is a story you could share with someone one day that will help them feel understood in a way that no one else can. Mm. And you know, if there's ever, not that I think that we need to be finding a lesson in trauma or always, you know, finding a meaning in it or why did this happen? Sometimes stuff just happens, but I think it can be a beautiful way to use that experience um, and, and share that in a positive way with someone else. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think there's, there's so much truth in what you're saying and the, the greatest lesson that we've ever had to learn can be so powerful for someone else who's most likely at day one of learning that lesson and just, you know, cause I was looking at it, hearing your story is obviously very, very validating to my story because it's so innocuous, you know, but yeah. it's funny how we, we look at trauma and I think, you know, we're all, um, we're all learning more now with the internet and all that sort of thing. But um, we can look at that and be like, Oh, well, you know, it's not as though I went to war or I was sexually abused, like I said before, but even that is just shaming and then pathologizing even more and dividing the self even more. So hearing speak, people talk about their relativity of their pain is helpful for other people out there that are like, I don't deserve. It's almost like I don't deserve to be feeling anxiety right now, which is so insane, especially mm. when you're on the other side of it. Totally. And like, I think another example would be say a relationship breakup. Now mm. nearly all of us go through that experience of some people don't. Um, bless them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they can, they they can have their fun. <laughs> yeah, you go enjoy your perfect life. Yeah, yeah. They, they will have their own. They will have their own things to deal with anyway. We all do, don't we? But say a relationship breakup. It might have been an amicable breakup. It might have been a lovely relationship or a relationship where you just started going in different directions or there's no cheating and you and you think, why am I so hurt by this? Why did this break me? Um, but that's a perfectly normal response um for for someone who has lost a significant like attachment figure in their life a significant relationship um it feels like it feels like that person died you mm. know in a lot of those in a lot of those situations and that is traumatic and i think um you know we all have so we all have these innocuous sort of traumas and it could be easy to say well everyone goes through breakups so i should be able to deal with this um, and, you know, like minimize it and dismiss your, your experience. But, you know, these can have a deep and lasting effect on us. And, and I think um, it's important to at least allow people the space to and, and give them permission to explore that and say, you know, this was a big thing that happened in your life. And you're allowed mm. to still be feeling it five years later or reacting in some way to it 10 years later, you know. For, uh, absolutely. Because I mean, th I mean, that's part of the recovery process, isn't it? That, you know, just validating the story, um, you know, even having the words to explain the story gives us power over it. It's something that, okay, we're now starting to integrate. It happened in the past. It's no longer who we are anymore. We're not carrying the burden of shame and fear with us um, and all that sort yeah. of thing. And, Georgie, I was wondering if I could um, move it on a little bit because I'm really interested to um, learn about what happens in the gut and in the body with nutrition and how that can play a role in, in anxiety. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so I basically, the way that I put this into context is that in the, in the world we live in, the environment around us we, and our life experiences, we all have 
potential triggers for anxiety. And our, our, our world is anxiogenic, anxiety inducing, um, just inherently. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, it's important for, for most of us to be thinking about how resilient are we to those triggers. And that's where we can make alterations. We can't change the world necessarily. Um, unless we, you know, have a virus outbreak and it shuts everything <laughs> down. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. We, we can. <laughs> um, but we, so we can't change the world as it is. <laughs> we can't tell the virus to go away either. Yes. Um, but we can look after our resilience. And this is where um, gut health, nutrition, hormone balance, uh, getting enough sleep, getting enough rest. Are you having fun? Are you mm -hmm. connected to your community? Um, and are you also having some kind of an awareness of your thoughts. And so that can involve meditation, um, but it can involve just that questioning of yourself as well. Like, oh, my mind's telling that fear story again. So all of those mm. things are important. But if your gut is totally out of whack and your gut microbiome's out of balance, this is the bacteria, the viruses, the fungi, the protozoa that all live in our digestive system, then you are going to be experiencing a, a lessened resilience to anxiety. So you may, for example, jump when the door is slammed instead of being able to kind of react calmly to that. Yes, good point. <laughs> As an example. So um, the gut, for example, we are, there's two main components. Well, actually there's a lot of components. I'm like, where do I even start? Yeah. It's, so, it's so good. I love it. But um, <laughs> essentially <laughs> we are, our gut bacteria send messages through a cord between our brain and our gut called the vagus nerve. It's a nerve. It's a network of neurons. Um, it, it connects brain and gut. And our microbiome, when we have the right bacteria there, they can um, basically send chemical messages up to our brain to tell us to, to, to remain calm and relaxed mm -hmm. and to regulate some of those chemicals in our brain that we hear a lot about, like serotonin. And the other one you might not hear about as often is GABA, gamma amino butyric acid. I'm sure you've come across that one though, Tom. Yeah, um, but yeah please. Yeah, so, um, but we call it GABA for short. That's our affectionate na name for it. Yeah. And GABA is anti-anxiety, like it's your anti-anxiety best friend because when there's plenty of GABA in the brain, the, the brain activity is slowed down. And we all know what it feels like when you don't have enough GABA in your brain because that's when your thoughts are racing, mind is racing, all of that. Mm. And so our gut bacteria have an impact on the, the GABA, on the serotonin, which is quite, um, quite fascinating. And it's something that we can alter. Now, I wouldn't think, you know, I, I, most of us to some degree have um, some kind of imbalance to our gut health in some way, just from the way we live our modern lives. So this is, you know, taking uh, lots of different over-the-counter medications and things like that. Um, most of them do cause some kind of uh, change to our gut bacteria, especially things like um, ibuprofen, so non non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, the pill. That's a whole other topic to get yeah. into. But um, that's yeah, fascinating, often, though. So fascinating. Oh, yeah. Learning about the girls pill. who've never had girls who've never had any issues with their gut or bloating um, suddenly the pill comes into the story and, and that's where we Crazy. do some cleaning up. Yeah. But yeah. It, doesn't affect, it doesn't affect every girl. It's just certain, certain people who maybe were a little more, more vulnerable to that, that, that extra pressure mm. of, of something like the pill. And it um, would have been just to cut you off. I'm so sorry, but I just really want to make this point. It would have been so lovely um, even as a male to learn about the pill and genuinely learn about the menstrual cycle. And it's a monthly thing. And this is what happens because like, with our spouses and things, you know, depending how we can give back and, and actually provide what may need to be provided. No, obviously I'm not saying they don't need us or anything, but it's always good for that sense of community and support. It's like, okay, yeah. I can be really good in this specific area at around this time, you know? Yeah, totally. I love how carefully you treaded around that. You were like, don't want to upset any yeah. women about yeah. periods. I don't know enough about it. <laughs> I'm your um, prince. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Totally. And, and this is the thing as women, you know, um, when we're not on any like kind of um, synthetic hormones, we are, our hormones do fluctuate throughout the cycle and we're meant to not show up the same every week, every day. There are sure. times of the cycle where there's a load of energy and productivity and we're like yep. on fire. 
that's ovulation. And then there's times of the cycle, like leading up to the next period where we just like need to kind of hole up and rest and maybe reduce the, the workload as much. And, and yeah, it's a shame that we're expected in society to show up every day exactly the same with the same energy, the same output. For sure, for sure. And even just on yeah. a very um, basic level, even just something like fasting at certain times of the month, like little things like that. It's like, well, you know, person A's body is going through something very, very different to perhaps what person B's is going through. You know, it's just, just I just yeah. wish we had to learn that. But yeah. I know, but I suppose through history, um, we've kind of like women are too complicated because they change. So when it looks, when it comes to clinical studies and things like that, it's much easier to just focus on men because they're kind of like doing the same thing. All yeah, the time. yeah, 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 um, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Variable, which is yeah. why I think we, we, it's taken like now we're learning so much about women sort of maybe in the last uh, 20 years, we've got mm. so much more information um, than, than we did before. But anyway, that's a whole mm. other thing. Back to the gut. That'll be a, um, that'll be a second podcast. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll come back and talk about that. Um, sure. <laughs> we've got, so we've got medications, high stress. Um, we've got, um, you know, eating potentially a lot of processed foods, so many different things in our modern lives that, that everyone does, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's quite normalized that just put pressure on our gut microbiome and combine this with the fact that say a um, hundred or more years ago, our ancestors were consistently consuming fermented foods that contain good bacteria to replenish mm. the bacteria lots. So, you know, this is where we think about yogurt, kefir, um, kombucha, and, and um, kimchi as well, and sauerkraut and those kind of foods, depending on, you know, what your sort of genetic origins are. But mm. I, I think it's so interesting, like we, most of us don't consume those foods these days. Or if we have the, the yogurt, we're having the flavoured sugary one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're just going to, you my goodness or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and sprinkling on M&Ms and things. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> on occasion, sure. But um, yeah, so like this is, you know, there's all this pressure coming into our digestive system. So um, what we can do, and you don't have to do this perfectly, by the way, like your gut can handle a bit of stress. It's just about being aware of these things and how can you kind of construct your lifestyle so that you're supporting your gut more of the time. Mm -hmm. Maybe you um, cut back a bit on drinking, if, especially if you're having alcohol, you know, multiple days a week, every week. Um, maybe you don't need to take that pain medication every single time at the first sign of a headache. You yeah. Know, <laughs> maybe, maybe you can just drink some water and, and have a nap and that headache will go away. You know, mm -hmm. those kind of considerations is what, I, what I'm really talking about. And then um, the other side of things is the gut wall. So that's just our gut bacteria. The gut wall is uh, where, or the gut lining, um, this is where the, the concept of leaky gut comes in, which you, you might've heard of. Um, basically, this is where the cells that line our gut are damaged in some way, generally by those same things I mentioned before. Yeah. And uh, those cells start to swell up and become inflamed and they separate and little holes start to form. And your gut wall is the gateway between your, your digestive tract, so the food that's in there and everything, and the outside world as well, mm -hmm. um, and the bloodstream on the other side. So if that wall isn't nice and strong, things can end up getting into your bloodstream and into your body that shouldn't necessarily be there. And we have up to 80% of our immune system just under the gut lining. Wow. So Jesus. very important at this time, anyone that's wanting to look after their immune system, um, look after your gut health because yes. that's, that's that big link there. So let's say we have some, a few little holes in our gut lining and things end up getting into the bloodstream that shouldn't be there, such as undigested proteins. The immune cells will see these proteins and react to them as though something foreign has entered your body and shouldn't be there. And so they start attacking and this translates across your bloodstream and we get generalized inflammation, low grade mm. inflammation. And this is the start of a lot of different potential disease processes. And I'm talking very much at the cellular level here. This isn't something like you would feel like you've got a fever necessarily. It's not mm. like that. Um, but this is just slowly over time. So maybe over 10, 20, 30 years of living this way, um, your health starts to decline in, in some way, potentially, yeah. if we don't look after our guts. Um, but the other more immediate uh, response is that that inflammation translates to our brain. 
there's actually studies to show that the more leaky our gut is, the more leaky our blood brain barrier is, meaning stuff getting into our brain that shouldn't be there. Oh, um, God. I know it's creepy, isn't yeah. it? but again, this is all happening on a minor level and it is happening to most of us. And there's things we can do to kind of look after this. Um, and then when that happens, we've got some inflammation in the brain that alters the chemicals in our brain as well. Mm. So it makes it harder for our brain to, to release serotonin, for example. Wow. Yeah. And I've got a, um, cause that, that stuff is what I'm really interested about and tying it into, um, your story, I suppose as well is, what I love about um, the holistic approach is there are so many things that can add those 1%, 2% to an over, you know, overall fulfilling lifestyle. Mm. When we're moving through, I'm very interested in um, existentialism and finding meaning. And obviously when someone is going through something like you and I went through where our sense of family is no longer what it is. And like, how do I find myself individual development? How much of this, because what you're saying there is fascinating and it's literally like, right, the importance of good nutrition is just so fundamental. I wonder how much of that, like I wonder the difference between someone who had really good nutrition and was um, trying to find a sense of meaning as opposed to uh, someone who had a sense of meaning but had really poor nutrition, what, what the comparison would be there. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk on that. Yeah. Um, so I think what this goes back to, I was that person that didn't have the meaning and just had the good nutrition. Yes. And so still I was feeling something bad's going to happen in my life. I was imposing those, those food rules from a place of fear. If I don't do this, I've, I've failed today, you know? And so um, I think it's pretty hard to, to measure that, especially yeah. the mind stuff and how much mind work you've done. Cause we all know, like, I'm sure you've done a ton of this stuff on yourself, Tom, and you continue to, to kind of keep that, keep that room in your head nice and tidy. Um, <laughs> and I do the same, but we all know that something can still come from left of field in our lives and knock us completely. And then we're like, oh, sure. I'm just a terrified person again. Yes. I need more spinach. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, I need more spinach. Yeah, for um, sure, for so, sure. Like, you know, you can be in a good place, but that fluctuates, that's changeable. So pretty hard to measure, but I definitely think that having the nutrition component with the mental awareness and finding meaning and all of that uh, makes it easier to find mm. the meaning. It makes it easier to sit down and meditate because the physiology is on your side. So I see it kind of like you can swim upstream or you can just allow the current to kind of take you. Brilliant. More. So how do we work with our bodies and help our bodies to, to find that calm place more easily? So how can we mm. assist our brain in making more of those calm chemicals so that when I sit down to meditate, I'm not jittery and like racing and, and freaking out. Um, when I sit down to meditate, I'm already halfway there potentially. Yes. Yeah. Question answered. That's awesome. How long does it take? Um, let's just say someone has been eating a typical Western diet, um, you know, is experiencing all of these issues like, you know, perhaps eczema, um, anxiety, all that sort of stuff, you know, coinciding with, uh, you know, a reasonable adherence to a good gut program. How long does it take to, to kind of, you know, move away from all of that stress? Yeah. Good question. Um, I would say, well, stress is like an ongoing battle. Oh my gosh. Like I definitely, <laughs> I definitely hear clients say, you know, oh, my stress is so much better than it used to be. But like, I, you know, I can still have stressful days too. For sure. That's like, oh, that's life. Yes. Um, we can mitigate that as much as we can and we can support our nervous systems, but gut healing generally, um, ballpark, we say about three months, okay. we, but you'd start to see improvements, um, earlier than mm. that. And it, it does depend how, um, without being restrictive about it, how committed you are to it. So let's say if you're in, you're a bit kind of like, Oh, I forgot to take my, you know, gut healing powder you gave me. <laughs> stuff it's like well they can't work unless you take them yeah yeah <laughs> and then yeah. you you know then combine in that time period you've also had a, a week's holiday and you were sipping cocktails all day you know and having lots of fried food well it's gonna set you back it's gonna it's gonna make pull that out to maybe six months but i like people to have flexibility so i don't want anyone being too rigid about this stuff um it really depends how 
intense the gut issues are. So yeah. for a lot of people that get a lot of bloating and they find they react to a lot of foods, they're generally pretty happy to just be pretty vigilant about it. But for the average person, let's say you or me, I'm going to assume you don't have a lot of obvious gut issues that kind of disturb you. You can eat most foods and you, you, your body doesn't yell at you for it. it used um, to be a lot worse. I used to be allergic to everything, you know, like really? literally, oh, everything, nuts, tomatoes. Um, God, I just gone blank now, but all sorts of things. I had terrible bloating and I was very like puffy. Um, I'm sitting in like a fucking sauna right now. So like, I'll probably look like I'm quite puffy, but, um, yeah, since moving into more fasting and, you know, taking, um, like wheat and dairy out, it's been a lot better for me, but, um, yeah. it is no, an, on yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and it's, a, I suppose it's a thing of like, well, I really had a great day today. Let's go out and have a pizza sort of thing. I recognize the ramifications. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. And and see, some people really do react to gluten and dairy and some people just don't. Yeah. And that's okay as well. I don't. I would hate anyone to think that it's necessarily healthier to exclude those foods from your diet. But for some of us, like you feel it. And yes. so that's really important for you and worth it for you to most of the time not eat it. Mm. Oh, and yeah, course, exactly. The next level is if you're celiac disease and you're, you, you're full, like you cannot have a speck of gluten, well, because if you do, you're bedridden for three days. Like, yeah. why? <laughs> you know, you can see there's a clear give or take. But when it's because uh, I for a while I was really strict, gluten free, dairy free, and I didn't need to be. And these days, mm -hmm. those foods are in my diet. Um, you know, not tons and tons. Like I'm not eating like a loaf of bread a day, all that kind of thing. <laughs> that makes one of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I don't think that much about it. I, I, you know, as long as I've got some nutritious food i'm i'm pretty you know chill about it um but did you do some uh particular gut healing or did you just allow yourself to it sounds like in the absence of those aggravating factors your body just kind of found its own balance yeah well i mean i mean siobhan um has always been very good with it and i think part of just obviously living together and stuff is i've just kind of moved into that paradigm fasting was really good for me and then um it was more just a process of elim elimination. I think to your point before as well, um, writing is my sense of meaning. It's what really thrills me and, you know, allows me to just be me really. And I found mm -hmm. that uh, I'd start, to, I'd, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd start to play around with my diet a little bit here and there. And I found that on the days that I'd been eating really poorly, my ability to be creative and formulate my sentences and things which were real were a whole lot worse. So it came back down to that outcome idea. Like what do I actually want to do if I want to write for the rest of my life and write good, good books? Um, well, diet is a, is a component of that, you know? Yeah. And that's so you're, you've just illustrated the perfect example of how this idea of like, when you do look after your nutrition and your gut health, then it's easier to float downstream with the mental stuff. So when you took out the dairy and the gluten, and you, your gut would have healed in that process because your gut in particular is really, that was too much of a load for you. Um, you would have had that, a bit of that leaky gut. You would have had particles ending up in your bloodstream that shouldn't be there. And that low grade inflammation that then was, imagine, imagine infl inflammation in the bloodstream and then in your brain. Yeah. That's brain fog. You know, that's that lack of concentration. And so then it was harder for you to do the mindset work, to do your journaling and writing and, and, and expressing yourself and putting those mm. sentences together. And so if we can support you in that sense, which you, you've done, um, then you've found that it's easier to, to center yourself and think clearly. Yeah. Yeah. And it helps on the podcast too, <laughs> making sure yeah, that I'm yeah. like on point and yeah, no, no, absolutely. I love this. I, I love how it all flows together, you know? Yes. Yes, absolutely. What, what was, um, I don't want to take too much of your time, but what was that? Because it sounds like you were studying naturopathy whilst you were uh, trying to find that sense of fulfillment and what became of it was this ability to give back. But um, your, your you know, good gut health and stuff became before it. So I was wondering if you could talk people through um, how you slowly began to realize that, no, no, this is anxiety coaching is, is really what I want to do. And this is the reason why I look after my um, gut health health in general. Yeah, totally. Um, so I suppose, yeah, I was still 
working it out when I was studying because I thought I was just going to be a general naturopath and nutritionist. Yeah. I didn't think I was going, I didn't know, you know, you sort of would throw around pot- potential ideas of what you might specialize in, but I was like, I don't know. Yes. Um, Astronaut. I let, <laughs> I let it come to me. And then when it did, I was like, oh my God, this was so obvious the whole time. Like, cause it just was obvious. I, every single time um, we would cover a component about mental health, mm. anxiety, the, her- the anti-anxiety herbs, I was obsessed with them. My, my, you know, cupboard was stocked with them I was having I was drinking those t- herbal teas while I was studying to calm myself like I knew so much about the anxiety stuff and that was so easy to sink and and the depression too and it was so easy to sink into my mind um, mm. that I really became aware that that was the thing for me um, but I guess um, you know I, I suppose I, I realized that it was only when I really started to I did a lot of the physio- physical stuff, the looking after my gut health, the nutrition, um, hormones, but I realized that, that that just wasn't enough. I needed to be also, I've got so many journals. Like mm. I had to journal. I had to also do that. And when I didn't do that, I felt the weight in my head, you know? And really, like if I'm super honest, starting to take that into a bigger context of my life and challenging my life and, uh, and challenging, challenging what's possible. Mm. So for a lot of long time, my brain told me, my anxiety told me that I, you know, like should, should, shouldn't hope for a big life or excitement or adventures, or, you know, that just happens to movie stars or move or people in movies. Like that's yeah. not reality. You know, don't, don't think that you can, you know, leave this beautiful, safe, lovely relationship and, you know, that you'll have a great time. But I did. I, can't, I, I literally challenged the anxious thinking. I took that leap of faith and in that made a massive leap forward in being able to trust the world again. Because right. what my parents' divorce took away was my sense of I can trust the world. Mm. And I just keep building that back. Mm. I That's trust brilliant. things are going to work out. Even coronavirus. Yes. Well, don't go too far. (laughs) We're all definitely going to die. That's in the research. So, (laughs) Yeah, no, that's so cool. And I think um, just to reiterate something that you touched on there, it's such a good um, idea for people to recognize that whatever comes to you really easily, you know, where it's like you, you almost can't understand why other people don't get it or why people don't see the world like that. There's probably a whole lot of truth in that, you know, oftentimes it's something that we did as kids. Um, some, some kind of topic where we're able to retain information like nobody else can. It's just this, this idea that when people talk about the self, it's like this idea that the self is talking to you through this, this outlet. And, um, it's almost like, you know, for me, someone would say like, Oh, you know, where do you even begin with writing a book? It's just like, well, what do you mean for you? especially with all the stuff you're doing around anxiety coaching and around gut health. It's like, no shit. Everyone knows this. It's like, because it's so incredibly alluring that it all goes in and stays there. Yeah, absolutely. It's that thing that's, you could just keep talking about for days and it's effortless, but you know, what's funny is it, is it did creep up on me as, as the thing for me to pursue. Like I really, as I said, I I was like, I just, I almost dismissed it because it was too easy in many ways. Not that anxiety is easy, but, yeah. <laughs> but I, I absorbed information about it so effortlessly. And I, I think this is, you know, now I've been able to create really from, from doing those questions of instead of, our, instead of my brain going, well, what if it all goes wrong? I, I say, what if it all goes right? Yes, like, yes. I, I, I literally, you know, practice writing what my ideal future would look like because I think that's a wonderful thing to do and it actually makes that, potential a lot greater in our lives as well and i and i'm in a position now where i I, 10 years ago five years ago i never would have thought that i would be um working from my computer i'm not bound to a location so i that settles my my anxiety about being locked down in one place i know where my roots are i know that melbourne is my home but i can always you know go somewhere around the world and take consultations from there and still run my program and still Um, connect with my my audience like that is the ultimate liberation and so that's that's my dream it's been my dream to do that to to be able to kind of explore the world or live in shift the environment sometimes 
have adventures, but also be able to help people and do this mm. work. Um, and this is what I meant before when I f- said it, it has been, I can't deny, like having built this and, and um, doing what I'm doing has given me that purpose that has helped my anxiety for sure. But I don't, that doesn't mean everyone has to be doing what I'm doing. And I think especially in say, if anyone's wanting to get into that online kind of world, there's so many opportunities. This is like a side passion of mine. I love telling people about about (laughs) freedom you can create because, because of that one skill you have. So Tom, like you could potentially run, I don't know, a writing course and show people, take people through that book writing process and what that's like. Mm. Um, and you might disregard that because you're like, well, do I really? But Whatever, Georgie. <laughs> It'll be a Corona course. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you only have For to sure. get one or two steps ahead of someone else in the knowledge that you have. And I think so often we, yeah, we dismiss it because it came e- easily to us, but maybe that's mm. the thing to, to follow. Yes. And it's, uh, that's, an, that's a worthwhile consideration as well uh, in this day and age, especially in the beginning when we were talking about uh, professionalism and university and degrees and doctorates and all that sort of stuff. It's people, you know, no one likes the um, used car salesperson anymore. We just want the result. And if you got there, no matter how many years you've studied, it's like, okay, well, you're for, further ahead than I am. I have something to learn from you, you know? Um, that's, right. that's such an important consideration. And also to, especially with what you're saying, it, it is ironic that, for you and I, what became our sense of purpose was helping people with uh, anxiety and mental health. You know, people can go through that shit and then they can be like, well, my sense of purpose is helping people uh, with data analytics or like building an app, you know, but whatever it is, it, it really does have to be that, that idea whereby the outcome um, is irrelevant. It's the, the fruits of the labor are, are actually in the labor itself. Totally. And this is, I think, where most of the time there is a hidden benefit to anxiety if we listen to it. And perhaps that person who had that passion for data analytics and helping <laughs> yeah. people with that um, was feeling anxious because they weren't doing that. They felt the call, but they, there's something in them saying, I'm not in the right place right now. I, I you know, it's that, it's that voice of something's wrong. I'm not I'm not following this dream of mine. I know there's something bigger for me, but I'm not doing it. Mm. Often our anxiety can be the blessing that pushes us to that. And in my life, certainly it's, it's been the desire and the determination to conquer this thing and not let it hold me back and not let it make me play life small. Mm. That has been the greatest blessing really. Cause I've, I've ended up saying, screw you anxiety. I'm going to do it anyway. Even if you say, Oh, well, the reality is Georgie and, you know, come back to earth, Georgie. I've got actually family members who say that to me sometimes, but it's oh, like, yeah. Don't we all? <laughs> look, look what you can create and you can, you know, end up living a, a life that feels to you like the life of your dreams, whatever that might be for you. Mm, yeah. Pain, pain is on the other side of anxiety. It's an emotion. It's something we can't get rid of, you know, but on the other side of that awareness is, is uh, harnessing it for its incredible motivating power. And you said before, you know, we all have stresses in our lives. It's like, yes, but the stress is now worthwhile. It's like a deadline. It's like, okay, it's making me fulfill my potential. It's not just something that's happening to me anymore, you know? Exactly. And what is, I I love just questioning, what is that message in your anxiety? What is it pointing you? Usually it's pointing us towards something that needs to be healed. Mm. Whether that is, uh, you know, going for the dream, going, like following that, that, calling you feel or whether it's actually going back and addressing your issues with your father or whatever that might be and when you heal that and the anxiety gets better and you don't carry this wound with you or this feeling of lack or i'm not doing the thing i need to be doing life gets so much better Mm. so anxiety can sometimes often be the roadmap to a much better life Mm. Yes. Yes. It's got a, Ooh, that could be the name of the podcast. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> I like that. To a much better life. Yeah, exactly. that's good. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> um, Georgie, just quickly tell us about um, the programs you do with your clients and um, anything exciting coming up. Yeah. Awesome. So um, I've just released, uh, well, just launched a, um, another round of the program. So we do the, the program live, but 
planning another two more rounds later this year, um, basically those for 12 weeks and each week we cover a mindset component and then a physical component related to anxiety. So um, we might go, we go through gut health, we go through hormones, but at the same time, we're also looking at forgiveness and all and rewriting that story you keep telling about your life that keeps you anxious. Mm. Um, so it's amazing because it's, it's 90 days of just like dedicating yourself to that work. Um, and then I also work with clients one-on-one, -on -one. but I, um, probably the best way to kind of keep in touch is through my Instagram, um, which is Georgie, the naturopath. Brilliant. And we'll have it in all the show notes and things and, um, uh, we'll make it really accessible for people to find you because it's really important work. And I think when you couple the strong component of feeling ready to tackle your anxiety with then actually the practical tools to do so, you're really setting someone up for uh, profound, long lasting change. Yeah, I love it. It's awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on the show. This definitely won't be the, uh, the only one. We'll, we'll keep hitting each other up. I'm sure we're in the same area, same time zone. Totally. We're going to be quarantined very, very soon. So we'll um, have plenty of time. <laughs> lots, lots of time to record podcasts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just one long live stream. <laughs> I love it. Thanks awesome. for having me. Brilliant. Cool. Peace, guys. Cheers.